why plant churches? I know uh, on the back of your lanyards, it's uh, church planting churches. I think that's what it says. Um, but I want to spend some time talking about why plant churches. Now, now I could easily uh, use this time to talk about the different strategies of planting churches. I, I could do that. Uh, we could talk about uh, the different steps, the different ways. And, and, and that's a lot of what Acts 29 does. Uh, we, like I said, come alongside uh, individuals who are looking to plant churches. And then we do a couple things with them. Uh, we assess, right? We want to make sure that, that God has clearly called you to plant a church. And then uh, where he has, we want to make sure that you have the necessary gifts to do that. So we assess you. Uh, and then we coach you. So we don't just say, okay, we've taken you through the assessment. You're ready to go. And that's it. Good luck. No, no, no. We come alongside you and coach you. Uh, and then we also train. We're involved in a lot of training initiatives, much like this one. Uh, and then we support uh, every step of the way. Uh, we are there with you. That's uh, the very nature of Acts 29. And so I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but I, but I won't. Uh, because I know that the context here is very different to the context in South Africa. In the same way that the context in South Africa is very different to the context in Kenya or the US or Europe, that, that we live in a world that has uh, different cultures. And so because of those different cultures, there are different realities and different challenges. And so if I come here with uh, some great steps of how to plant a church, you might sit there and go, those sound great, but they are not going to work for my context. They just won't. And so I thought, well, let me not do that. I, I prefer to engage at that level in a smaller group, maybe even one-on-one. -on -one. I like to ask some questions. You know, tell me a little bit about your city. Tell me a little bit about your neighborhood. What, what do the people love? So that we can break it down and go, okay, here's where I think you need to go. This is how you should approach it. So I'm not going to do that this morning. Rather, I want to spend my time with you in talking about why plant churches? Why so passionate about the planting of churches? And, and to be honest, this is probably something uh, that's been now on the radar for the last few decades. I mean, people have been planting churches for a very long time, but I think it, it feels like everywhere you go, people are now talking about planting churches. In fact, as I talk to many of my friends in the U.S., as they send out missionaries, they're beginning to change their strategies. And they're going, listen, we don't want to send one or two or three people to go be missionaries somewhere, but rather we're trying to figure out how can we send people so that they might plant churches, healthy churches, and then so that we might see those healthy churches multiply. People are talking about church planting. And so... If you want to be faithful to the scriptures, the, the next question that you should ask, especially as people come uh, with great passion and conviction about planting churches, is to go, okay, can you show me where in the scriptures where it says that? Is there a verse in the Bible that says, go plant churches, thus says the Lord? If you search long enough, you'll realize that it doesn't exist. Nowhere in scripture are we told to plant churches. And so this should beg the question, then why so passionate? Why? Why so passionate? Why, why would an organization like Acts 29 exist? An organization that wants to plant churches everywhere. Why? Why would a church like ours, so Rooted Fellowship, we just celebrated four years in September, but by the grace of God in 2020, we will be planting two new churches. And then in 2021, we'll be planting a, another church. And then the plan in 2022 is to kind of revitalize, replant an existing church. Why, why would a church so young, only four years old, want to plant churches? Why so passionate? Why? Why should we be concerned about the planting of healthy churches? Now, I, I could take you to various places. I could take you to Matthew 28 to make the case for why we are called to plant churches, a, a passage that many of you would be familiar with, where Jesus says to his disciples, therefore go and make disciples. You're very familiar with it, the Great Commission. Some might say in that, listen, we're called to make disciples, and so maybe the best way to do that is to plant healthy churches. In fact, it's one of our distinctives as Acts 29. We believe that the local church is God's primary strategy for his mission. We want to make 
disciples. And so we say the planting of churches is probably the best strategy to do so. We want to be obedient to the great commission. Now, now many of us probably think of the great commission as the great suggestion. That God is merely suggesting that you make disciples. That if you have time in your busy schedule, then go and make disciples. But no, it is the great commission. It is a commandment that if you are a Christian, you must strive to be obedient to. And so as a church, you should seek to apply every strategy possible to make disciples. Here's why we plant churches. I could take you to Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul, speaking of his ministry, says this. Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 8 to 13. He writes, this grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ, to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavens. I I love this word, multifaceted. That it has many different aspects and features. The the wisdom of God. That that every time you get around one part of God, you're opened up to another part. It's almost like Paul is is trying to sell you a car. You know the car salesman. You know, they get you into the dealership and they say, take a look at this car, it's incredible. And you look at it and you're like, wow, it's phenomenal. And they, and they start listing w- what this car has. ABS, power steering, leather seats. In fact, get in the vehicle, feel those leather seats. And so you get in and you're like, wow, this is amazing. And he says to you, isn't it spacious? It is. And he tells you about uh, how many uh, kilometers it can make on the gallon. And then he says to you, but wait, there's more. The air conditioning, heated seats, and you're going, you know what? I think I'm going to take this car. But wait, there's more. There's no key. You just press a button and it starts. What? What kind of futuristic car is this? Okay, where do I start? No, 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 no. Wait, there's more. That's what Paul is saying here, the multifaceted wisdom of God. You just can't get your head around it that forever we'll constantly be knowing more and more about who God is. But don't miss it. God's plan here is to reveal this wisdom through the church. It's through the church that that God says, this is how I'm going to make it revealed and known to everyone. It's not through men of God. It's not through bishop so and so. I'm not not saying that, no, 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 we shouldn't have uh, elders and leaders in the church. But if you are an elder, a leader serving in the local church, you must recognize that you yourself are part of that very local church. And that it's through the local church that God is revealing this wisdom, His wisdom to the world. This is why we plant churches. We want all of the world to know of God. And so he tells us that it's through the local church. I'm going to do this. And so hence we plant churches. But it's not going to be Matthew 28 this morning. It's not going to be Ephesians chapter 3. I want to take us to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to spend some time in this portion of scripture, and again, I'm answering the question, why plant churches? Why, why on air are you so passionate about planting churches? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the text to us. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 38. I'm going to read it to us, and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray that God would do something more incredible than we could ever imagine right here this very morning. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Hear these words of our Father. Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. kingdom. 
We just heard about it. And healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Let's pray. Father, we are incredibly thankful for your word. We're thankful that it continues to transform the individual lives of people. And so, God, would you do that yet again this morning? Would you do a work that only you can do? Would you open up our hearts to you, Father? Help us see you for who you are. God, I pray against the evil one and his desires to steal, kill, and destroy. But I ask that you would come and give life to the full. Would you help us to understand why, why, Lord, you value the church and how you use the church to reveal yourself to the world? God, it's to that end that I ask you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so the text begins by telling us that Jesus continued going around to all the towns, the ESV says cities, and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and every sickness. Now now the first thing we should notice about Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 is that it is almost the same as Matthew chapter 4 verse 23. In fact, the only difference between the two verses is that Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 says that Jesus was going all over Galilee. Whereas Matthew 9 verse 35 says that Jesus was going around all towns and villages. You see, the former Matthew 4 signifies the general area covered, while the latter, our passage for this morning, Matthew 9, demonstrates the extensiveness the breadth and depth and width of the work that was done. We know that the area of Galilee was about 65 kilometers wide and about 112 kilometers long. A Jewish historian tells us that there were around 200 cities and villages in that region with with about 15,000 people in the smallest. Now, I uh, wasn't always clever and uh, Matt was not always at the top of the list for me, but uh, when I look at those numbers, we can tell that there was at least 3 million people in that region. That's about the size of Pretoria, the city that I live in. I I know here in Lagos, that's probably just one street. (laughs) You're thinking to yourself, wow, why are you amazed by three million? That's just from here to there. If we acknowledge that Jesus went about in all of Galilee and that he went into all towns and villages, it is reasonable to assume that the majority of these three million people would have had some kind of direct exposure to Jesus. They would have heard of him. They maybe know someone who knows someone who knows someone who had seen him. There was some kind of exposure to Jesus. The point here is that Jesus did not limit himself and his acts of kindness and compassion to his own city. But he took a trip all throughout Galilee and not only visited the larger and more major cities and towns, but their villages as well. That he even went to the hard places, doing good to the bodies and souls of men and women in every place and of whatever state or condition. Friends, we need to be not only just concerned about our region where we live, work, and play, but but are we concerned about the other places? I, I love the city of Pretoria. I do. I love that city. But I am concerned about Nairobi. I am concerned about what happens in Lagos. I am concerned about the U.S. I am concerned about Europe and the Middle East and Asia. I'm I'm concerned about these places because I want them to know of Jesus. 
There is something here for us to learn. The text is specific, telling us that Jesus was teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. The teaching was more centered on explaining the meaning of the Old Testament scriptures to the people. He would walk in and he would unpack it. He would, he would make it plain to them. That you have heard it, that it says this, but here's what it means. Here's what it points to. The proclamation, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom was the direct application and announcement to the people that the prophecies were being fulfilled. Right there in that moment, the prophecies that they had known of were now being fulfilled and that they needed to repent for the kingdom was at hand. Everything that you've just heard about from, from Femi in the last session, the, the kingdom was at hand, so repent, turn. To repent is to turn, to turn from whatever it is that you are pursuing, hoping to find life and meaning and satisfaction, and turn from that so that you might turn to Jesus. The proclamation was the good news. It is what we call the gospel. The good news of God's graciousness and mercy to his people. That the Messiah was present. He was present and now among his people. The sacrificial lamb. Right there in front of him. The sacrificial lamb here to take away the sins of the world. That is what he was proclaiming. Friends, that is what we preach. Not 12 steps to something. Not your self-help book. We, we preach Jesus and Him crucified. That is the only way that we move from darkness to light. That is the only way that we move from being orphans to now being children of the Father who are seated at the table. And not only that, we have our Father's ear. This is why we can boldly approach the throne of grace. The sacrificial lamb here to take away the sins of the world. Jesus banished sickness and disease from his presence through his ministry of healing. The blind received sight. The lame walked. Lepers were cleansed. The deaf could hear. The dead were raised up. Jesus healed every kind of sickness and every kind of disease as he ministered throughout Galilee. This is what he did. We're, we're told that this is what he was on about. And so verse 35 tells us what Jesus did. Verse 36 tells us why. Read with me. It says, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them. Because they were distressed. This is the Christian Standard Bible. They were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. See, we're told that he felt compassion because they were distressed and dejected. Matthew here uses a strong word to communicate the compassion Jesus felt. He says that they were distressed and dejected. Maybe you read the NIV or ESV. It says that because they were harassed and helpless. Harassed and helpless. The New King James Version says because they were weary and scattered. These are not good things. If you're sitting here and you're wondering, is that, is that a good thing to be scattered, to be weary, to be is that should, Do I want to be that? No. The message says that they were confused and aimless. You see, Jesus wants us to see what he saw in the crowd. And that is the people that he looked at, they were battered, they were bruised, distorted, ripped apart, worn out, exhausted. And friends, this is no different to what we see today. You, you don't have to go too far to see this. Even in Pretoria, even in, in the, the suburbs of Pretoria, where I minister, I mean, they'll, they'll show up on a Sunday. 
they'll walk into the building and then you'll ask them, how are you doing? And they'll have this big smile on their face. I'm great. Great pastor. And then I'll look over their shoulder and be like, but, but your whole life is falling apart. How can you be great? It's because we've bought into this lie of pretending. And we come to church to do that. We, we gather with the people of God and, and, and we pretend because we think that's what's expected. When, when you know, especially many of you leaders and pastors, you, you know when you preach or when you teach on a Sunday and you look at your people, you can see bruised, battered, worn out, exhausted. But we want to pretend what I call religious fronting. I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Great. God is good. God is good. All the time. But, but they don't even believe it. You say that enough, you'll see it'll get softer and softer and softer because they are now confronted with the fact that they are not doing well. That they are bruised and battered. That they are exhausted. That the pressures of life are on their shoulders. That, that this, this thing we call life, the, the furnace has turned up the heat. Whether it's political, economic, social, relational, whatever. And Jesus sees this. He sees right through them. He wants us to see this, the brokenness of this world, the fact that all of us are in desperate need of a Savior. And he's, he's here saying, I am that Savior. I am the one that you have been waiting for. See, Jesus sees the heart. He saw the hearts of these people as wounded and torn by the effects of sin. They were inwardly devastated and helpless in their sinful and hopeless condition. These people are not just in your gathering times, but they are in your neighborhood. They are at your places of work. They are your friends and your family. You see them everywhere. Jesus was filled with compassion for them. That's what the text tells us. He was filled with compassion for them. Compassion in the Greek is this word, splach nizome. I love that word. Splach nizome. Which can inadequately translate in English as to have compassion. Many times I feel like the English language fails us. Uh, the English language being my third language, it fails us. See, in the Greek, its meaning is a bit stronger than simply to have compassion. Splach nizome. It's to be deeply moved. Have you ever ha had that feeling in your stomach where something happens and you, you just you feel moved, that you feel it in your inner being? To be affected in one's inner being. That's what Jesus has here. Splach. Nizome. And I, I had to think a little bit um, when I studied this text. I had to go where Jesus was and ask myself, uh, when have I ever felt that, that level of compassion? And it didn't take me too long. I didn't have to think for long. It took me to a place not too long ago when uh, I was at church one Sunday and I finished preaching and I, and I come off the, the stage that we had. And I don't even know if we can call it a stage. It's a bunch of boxes. And I came off it and I walked to one of our leaders and he came to me and he said, listen, I need to tell you, your daughter is in the hospital. Your wife just called me. You need to get there quickly. And so I, I literally dropped everything, handed over everything, got in my car, drove to the hospital. Went through emergency. They told me where the children's ward wa was, and I made my way there. The first person I saw was my wife, and I could see on her face things weren't good. 
And as I came past the curtain to the bed where my daughter was lying, there she was, almost lifeless, with tubes in her. See, she, we thought she had just caught the flu, but later found out that she had bronchitis. And so for an infant, that is not a good thing. Almost lifeless. I was broken, heart broken. It, it hit me right in the pit of my stomach. I felt splach nizome, compassion. And I wanted to exchange places with her. I wanted to exchange places with her. See, compassion, according to Matthew, is to be deeply moved that you would exchange places with the one that you feel compassion for because of what they are going through. You have empathy, not just sympathy, but empathy. You, you feel with them, not just for them, but you feel with them. And so in that moment, I wanted to exchange places with them. Friends, if you're listening to me, you know where I'm going. This should take us to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where it says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. It's, it's what the, the fathers of old refer to as the great exchange. That's what happened on the cross was the great exchange that, that Jesus took our sin in exchange for His righteousness. That he looked at us and, and this compassion that he felt for us because we were swimming in our sin, bathing in it, believing that it would give us all that we need. And so he stepped in and he says, I will exchange my life for yours. I will live the life that you could not live and die the death that you deserved. So that for all those who cross the line of faith, for all those to look to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you might be reconciled back to the Father. That's the compassion that Jesus felt when he looked at them. That's the compassion that he has when he looks at this world that is broken and filled with sin. Friends, I believe that's the compassion we should have. As we make our way out, these doors, and as we look at our city and we look at our neighborhoods, do we look at people who don't know Christ as their Savior? And are we filled with that compassion? Do we pray and say, God, would you save them? Would you reach into their hearts, in, into the dark places of their hearts, and save them so that they might know the joy that is found in Christ? Jesus says that they were like sheep without a shepherd. See, these sheep had no shepherd, no one to protect and guide them. Those that were supposed to be leading them were not leading them to God, for they were instead wolves leading them away from the true and proper worship of God. I don't have to go into detail about this. We know of many places that call themselves the church. We know many people who call themselves pastors who are leading many astray. In my own city, I could tell you of stories. I'm sure you probably saw this on the news about the pastor who wanted to show how powerful he was. And he said, look, I can make my congregation go outside and eat grass. That, that was in my city. Not even 20 minutes away from where we gather. A couple of weeks later, another story comes up of, of another pastor who's like, well, no, hold on. Let me show you how powerful I am. I can make them drink petrol and they won't die. I mean, what, is, what does that have to do with the scriptures? Where do we find that? And yet so many people are finding themselves in those places. Sheep without a shepherd. Being led astray. This is not a new thing that we see today was very present in Jesus' day. We know of churches that would say, no, if you sow this seed of blessing, making us think that God is like an ATM machine. 
right? If you, if you press the right buttons, then the right amount of money will come out. Or, or we, treat, we treat the Bible like, like it's, it's, a, it's a genie in a bottle. Like if you, if you rub it right, I'm sure many of you know the story of Aladdin. If you rub this right, you will get your three wishes. Sheep without a shepherd. Are we filled with compassion for these people? Or maybe we're those people who have found a safe place in our local church and we love it so much and we just want to protect it and we want no one else and we don't want to think for anyone else. That is not what we are told here. But yes, we are inward focused, but we are also outward focused. But let me transition here. Jesus then shifts the metaphor. His imagery from a flock to now a field. Jesus would have been a great school teacher. I'm just saying. This is phenomenal. Jesus now envisions an enormous crop that is ripe and ready in need of harvesters. The unreached people of this world, this continent, this country, this city, your neighborhood is in desperate need of more faithful disciples of Jesus filled with the gospel. Verse 37, he says, he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant. The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Put plainly, the ripe harvest can go to waste if there are no workers, if there are no laborers, the harvest will go to waste. If we do not take advantage of this abundance, it'll go to waste. J Jesus warns us that the opportunities to meet human need and bring people into his kingdom may go to waste because of a shortage of workers. That's a whole par paradigm shift. It really is, because for the longest of time, I, I kept wondering if there was any harvest. And yet Jesus says here, no, no, no. There is so much out there. Th that is not the issue. The issue is my disciples. There are so few of you. A and even those who are present, many of you are treating the Great Commission like the Great Suggestion. You feel like you've got your ticket to heaven and I'm just going to wait. Notice Jesus refers to them as workers, as laborers in some translations, implying that there is work to be done. There is work to be done. The need that Jesus saw and wanted his disciples to see was great. It is a great need. It is overwhelming. It is overwhelming. And so in verse 38, he makes his request to them to respond to this need. He knows that it's overwhelming, but he still makes a request. He says in verse 38, Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, if you're like me, this should surprise you. What he says here should surprise you. If you're like me, after saying all of this, after unpacking all of this, after telling us that the harvest is ready, it's going to go to waste if you don't go. After telling us that, that we are to be filled with compassion. I would almost look to Jesus and say, I am ready to go. I'm ready to go. As we all should. But Jesus says, no, the harvest is abundant, ready, set, pray. I'd go, hold on, shouldn't it be go? No, 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 don't miss it. Be filled with compassion. Ask the Lord to give you eyes to see. Recognize that the harvest is abundant. Ready? Set, pray. Here's why Jesus calls us to pray. It's because we are human. Each and every one of us in here, we are human, despite what our children may think of us. 
Uh, anyone in the room know who Batman is? Show of hands. OK, there's a few. Um, here's how I know that I can host a, a parenting workshop, that I'm ready to give the best parenting workshop in the world. Here's why. It's because my five-year-old doesn't call me papa or daddy. She calls me Batman. I know many of you probably think I coerced her to do that. I would never do that. Randomly, one day, she looked at me and she said, Batman? And I didn't want to look shocked. I wanted her to think that this is normal. So I looked at her and I said, yes, my child. And ever since then, <laughs> I am referred to as Batman. Despite what our children think, we may be superheroes to them. We are human. We are limited and can only be individually and to some degree corporately involved in so much. But Jesus wants us to be concerned about more than what we can be involved with. He does. This is why I started by saying that, yes, be concerned about the city that you're in, the neighborhood that you're in. But there's a reason why we pray for the nations. You might go, yes, I, I am human and limited, but, but God calls me to be concerned about those who are far from me. So when there are areas we cannot be personally involved in, yet see the need, we can still be involved by seeking the Lord in sending others to meet the need. Let me say that again. So when there are areas we cannot be personally involved in, yet see the need, we can still be involved by seeking the Lord and sending others to meet the need. This is why from the very beginning when we planted our church, from the very beginning we started putting money aside to say we want to be putting this money, these resources aside so that we might, as we pray, be able to one day give so that we can send. That it's almost got to be in the DNA of your local church. Why? Because it's built into you as a disciple. We're called to make disciples who will go, who'll do what? Go on to make more disciples. Who will do what? To go on to make more disciples. That when you come to faith, when you come to Jesus, he plants a seed in you that should multiply. That we should be thinking three, four, five generations from now. We pray for countries, cities, and people that need to be taught the rich word of God and hear the, the scandalous gospel that brings people from darkness to light. And as we do so, God sends. When we pray, God sends. He sends workers. He sends laborers. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. The, the Greek word here for sent out is ekbalo. And it is much more aggressive in the Greek. It's this idea of pushing forward. Pushing forward. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would push forward workers into his harvest. Uh, the same word is used for the expulsion of a demon from a man possessed. It's that strong of a word. Why, why is such strong language, Jesus, you ask? Well, it's because it takes great power to drive out a demon. It will need equal power from God to drive out disciples so that we might go. See, many of us were stuck in our comforts. We, we create comfortable churches. I said this to our ambassadors. You see, we don't call our volunteers volunteers. We call them ambassadors. We say volunteers are those who stand at the side of the road as a race is happening and they give out water. In the church, we have ambassadors of the kingdom of God who are putting on display the kingdom of God. And so I said to our ambassadors this past week, that I don't believe God called us to plant and establish and multiply comfortable churches. We're called to be a comforting church. 
that those who would gather would be comforted by the gospel, but never comfortable. Because what happens is then we take life easy, we relax, no longer on mission, no longer concerned about the things that God is concerned for, and then we just want to protect ourselves. This great little community that we have, and no one else should come in. And so we see here the word ekbalo. Would you push them out? Would you compel them by the love of Christ? This is why we preach the word faithfully in and out of season is to say you need to be compelled by the love of Christ so that you might go out and make more disciples, so that you might go out and want to plant churches, so that you might see people come to faith, get them plugged into community, watch them grow, and then send out, and then repeat. We pray for his workers to go into the harvest. But here's the beauty of God's church. This is Big C Church. Here's the beauty of God's church. Listen carefully. We pray for workers to go out, but we must acknowledge that someone prayed for us. That we are a realization of a movement that came before us. That we are some local church's answer to prayer. It's phenomenal when you think about it like that. That we have gathered here, we, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because there were those who came before us that prayed that there would be a generation like this. So that we might be sent out into the harvest. So what does this mean for us? Well, I believe we pray and then we plant. We pray and then we go. We pray and then we multiply because we want all of the world to know of the love and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're in the city or whether you're in the rural place. We pray and then we go. Why do we plant churches? So that those who don't know of Jesus as Lord and Savior might taste and see that the Lord is good. Why do we plant churches? So that those who are lost, or as Matthew puts it, those who are distressed and dejected may find the good shepherd and follow him. Why do we plant churches? So that we might be effective and fruitful in the making of disciples who will go on to make more disciples and go on to make more disciples and go on to make more disciples. Why do we plant churches? So that we, as the church, by the power of the Holy Spirit, might be able to push back the darkness and see the light come in. Why do we plant churches? Because God's plan to reach the world was through his redeemed children saved by grace. You've heard Femi say that we, we were always part of the plan. It's not like God had a plan and then was like, oh no, and then fumbled and said, well, let me find a plan B. No, no, it's, it's always been part of the plan. By grace, God has called us into his mission. A mission that he is already on. And we did not come up with it. By grace, he invites us and says, come and do this great thing that I am doing. So that one day, as we see in Revelation, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, we will stand before the throne and we'll be able to tell stories. That's the part I'm so excited about. As we worship the one who is seated on the throne, we'll look left and right and we'll say, so tell me your story. How, how did you end up here? Well, you won't believe this. There was this local church that sent out a few people to my neighborhood and they planted this church. And one day I was walking past and I heard the gospel and I came to faith. And I was discipled in that church and I grew. And I thought, this is incredible. But before I got too comfortable, I was told that we are called to be a multiplying church, that there are those who don't know of Christ yet. And so I joined the team, even though I was in the business sector, joined the team, and we were sent out to another city to start another local church so that those people there would know of the good news of the gospel. That's a fascinating story. Can you turn to the, to the next person? How did you end up here? I'm telling you the stories will be the same. Faithful men and women seeking to be obedient to the Great Commission. 
And the best strategy to do that is in the planting of churches. Church after church, generation after generation, until Jesus returns or calls us home. For his glory, which leads to our joy. Friends, that is why we plant churches. Let's pray. And so, Father, we, we come asking that you would stir in us a passion for your name. That we would want to glorify you in everything that we do. Where we live, work, and play, we would want to make sure that wherever we are, in the spaces that we find ourselves, that you are being proclaimed. And so, Holy Spirit, would you convict us of this truth? That you are a God who loves to save. And it's by grace that you've invited us into the process of saving those around us. That you choose to use us. That we are, we are weak. That we are not perfect. That we are unfaithful. And yet that does not change who you are. What a thing to praise. God, I pray for every single person here this morning. I pray that they would reflect and they would ponder and consider this call to pray, to pray so that you might send out workers and laborers into the harvest, but also to be willing to be those laborers and workers. Would you take us out of our places of comfort? Would we lean into the gospel? knowing that you are with us every step of the way, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you are seated on your throne fully in control, and that is who we worship, a God who loves us more than we could ever imagine, and that is evident because of the finished work of Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, strengthen us, guide us, watch over us. We need you. Would you save many, not only in this city, but all across the world? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.